All right, this is an overview of the kinds of programming that the Champaign-Urbana Community Fab Lab does as part of its mission of public engagement at the University of Illinois. I want to go over some guiding principles as well as case study examples to give you an idea of the sorts of things you might do for programming if you were in a similar setting. The agenda, just to quickly review, I'm going to talk about the part of our mission that this matters with, uh, some overarching themes that we've noticed about all of our programming, uh, some examples of interactive exhibitions, short workshops, summer camps, university courses, open lab that might happen at a community center elsewhere in town, our Fab Academy, and hosted events. Uh, once again, I just wanted to look at our, our mission for those that maybe skipped to this presentation without watching any of the others. The Champaign-Urbana Community Fab Lab is an open and collaborative workshop space for computer-driven innovation, design, and fabrication. But it's a lot more than just a workspace. It's also a community of makers. So we enable makers of all kinds, so different sorts of people from in, inside the university and out and around the community and even around the state and other people we connect to in the world, uh, and makers of all kinds to imagine, design, and create using open source software and DIY equipment. We do this by working with a local and international network to actively cultivate public engagement, so community engagement, through community-focused art or art entrepreneurship, research, and education. And really the biggest mission that we have is to work with education. So most of the programming I'm going to be talking about today is related to education in some form or another. All right, just to review some overarching themes. So obviously the programming of a fab lab ought to match the institutional goals, but in our case, since we're partnered with several other organizations around the town, that means that we have a variety of institutional goals at hand. So the university obviously is interested in things like research and teaching and you know, reaching out to undergraduates and connecting in parts of the community to learn from them. Uh, but other organizations in town, for instance, the libraries might just want patrons to feel like they have ownership over their library. So that kind of goal might inform the way that we do work and programming and engagement at their space. Uh, similar to that, so you know, we work with libraries as partners, but uh, I jokingly say that you just need a librarian as a staff person. Maybe not literally a librarian, but uh, th there are lots of kinds of uh, <laughs> details and complexities that happen with programming. And really you need an organizer of information, things, and people to make all of this go. So you know, a lot of the time that's leadership, but then again leaders are sometimes so overwhelmed with everything they need somebody else to help organize them. So have somebody in there that's just a really, an organizer, but that's flexible. You know, not somebody that's going to try to dominate everybody and put them in a in a box or a specific schema, but really try to make organization that matches things that really happen in their real world and just help optimize it and make it easier to go. There's also, we really believe in a fluidity between digital and analog. <laughs> I don't know what the offline equivalent is or the, the non-digital equivalent is, but you have lots of computer-driven tools and learning that happens. But there's also a lot of learning that can happen, you know, with a good old-fashioned, like, set of woodshop tools or, you know, scraps of paper and, and, and tape and, and glue. That's all fine, too. So we like seeing the connection between all of that. We also like a lot of the digital creation that happens. You know, you can create very cool videos with online applications or things that you just do purely on a computer it doesn't also have to become physical so we like connecting sort of all of those different worlds in a, in a general spectrum of learning and education a lot of the time the space and the people you have are really going to be what determines the programming which is why it's so important to get different kinds of people into your space uh, and, and into your your programming uh, the, the people that help plan the programming so the, you know, if, if in our lab, we've kind of shifted over the years, you know, sometimes we've had more people that are interested in electronics. Lately, it's been a lot more emphasis on textiles and, and uh, costumes and fabrication and fashion design. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll start getting people that are interested in engineering robots and we'll start doing a lot with robots. You know, a lot of that will determine it. And our space has been really constrained in most of the oper uh, environments we operate in. So, you know, the libraries have limited teen spaces, some of them not permanent. You know, that determines a lot of the programming. And likewise, you know, they have librarians that are interested in some things or more comfortable with some things than others. So, you know, a lot of that obviously is going to determine what you do for programming. And that's fine. It should. You know, you shouldn't force some other model on them. You should have it gr organically grown because that's what will thrive. We also really believe risk taking is key is, you know, we, a lot of the time we're planning events sort of the night before and we're trying something we've never done before. And that's okay. You know, you, you have to be okay with failing and having things, you know, flop and not go very well. And you have to learn from that. So, you know, and this is not like risk taking of putting participants in, in a severe danger. It's more just like, you know, your, your evaluation outcomes have to be over a period of time that accounts into failures and successes and learning from all of that. 
for people that are very risk adverse, generally Fab Labs and iterative learning might not be a good match. Fun and passion should really be present. You know, if you've got people that are working with your programming team that don't really care about what they're doing or that, that you know, it's just sort of a job, it will be a lot harder to program well. You know, the cost of this is that you get people that are very invested. But I really think at the end of the day, so long as they're not adversarial with one another, that investment is really worth the trade-off. It will get you better programming and better engagement with your participants. And then finally, supporting documentation is really important. A lot of the time people will come up with a fun idea, they'll try it and then run it, and then they didn't have any documentation on how they ran it, what went into the process, what did they learn as they were doing it, what should they change for next time, you know, how can they share this with some other group when that person moves on. You know, the documentation piece oftentimes gets overlooked and it kind of goes back up to that you need a librarian. It's having some sort of organizer to help document is really important. And I say this largely just because in our experience, most of the people conducting programming are more extroverted, teacher, creative, disorganized types. You might have an environment where you maybe have not enough of those sorts of people and too many people that are really organized. And so, you know, maybe it wouldn't be as much of a thing. But I, I've noticed that a lot of Fab Labs have sort of creative free thinker types and not so much uh, uh, organizer types. Okay, so you can have interactive ex exhibitions as a kind of programming. For us, this oftentimes means what we call a road show or tabling. So uh, it's really just short moments of teaching. We're not really expecting people to you know, have this change their entire outlook on education or for them to learn a skill out of this. It's more like raising awareness and just kind of getting their attention about something. So uh, you know, you, you, when you're doing this, you'd want to learn about the purpose of the event you're going to. So for instance, we went to, oh, we're going to give the example in a minute. I'm not going to give you the for instance. Uh, but you learn about the purpose of the event and that will determine how you do your tabling and how you do your exhibition. Uh, you'll also want a checklist of all the things that you want to bring with you for this. And for us, this oftentimes just really comes down to practical stuff, like make sure you bring power strips, make sure that you're, you're, the people that are hosting you have internet and that they know you need internet and that you need power plugs nearby you and that you should bring tables and, you know, sort of banal things like that. But also a checklist for, you know, what, what do we want participants to experience? You know, what, what do we want this place to gain from, from us doing this? Can we make sure we have that checklist too? Uh, I also like having this concept of the talker, the maker, and the fixer. So during an event, you might have some demos out on a table and some machines out on a table, and you're going to be showing people the different kinds of things you could do with digital making. And the talker might be somebody that talks to the leaders or the adults or uh, the, you know, the representatives that come through the environment that are sort of higher level people. You know, they can explain the mission of all this and why it matters in a broad general scope uh, to education and that kind of thing. But at the same time, you should have somebody there that's actually just making stuff and playing with it and sort of helping participants learn how to make things, maybe demonstration stickers or, you know, helping them, them walk through their ideas uh, with the stuff on the table. And then I also say the fixer, because a lot of the time at these events, we bring a bunch of equipment and then we figured out that something doesn't work. Uh, for us, like 90% of the time, the 3D printer is broken in some way because 3D printers are just incredibly unreliable right now. And, and so, you know, it's nice to have the fixer there to hack the computer problem or the 3D printer problem or the electronics problem and not have to have that person be the person that's doing the talking or doing the making. You know, the fixer becomes sort of the behind the scenes person that's really, you know, in a public event, but they're, they're fixing all the stuff so that others don't have to be distracted by the broken stuff. Because invariably, when Whenever you're working with technology demos, something will not work and be broken. It's just kind of a reality of it. Uh, and then paying a lot of attention to presenting yourself well, you want to pay attention to the aesthetics. So, you know, like a lot of maker groups I'll see, they'll kind of roll out to an event and they throw a bunch of stuff on a table and they don't really explain any of it very well. They don't bother to like put a tablecloth down or have anything like showing their identity. And, uh, they don't really think about whether or not their their item is interactive or not, or if it's relevant to the participants that are that are that are visiting it. You know, this kind of goes back to the learn about the purpose of the event, and then rig what you're bringing to the event uh, to be to match that. Uh, and then I write here, entropy is real, which is really just that no matter how well you plan, whenever you do one of these exhibits, something will be chaotic and change. You know, like there have been so many times we've shown up for a community event where they say, oh, yeah, you know, there'll be like, you know, 20 people or something and you can run demos for all of them. And we show up and there's 200 people. And, uh, you know, instead of, uh, you know, we thought we'd have 10 minutes with them, we actually get five minutes with them. And, you know, just stuff changes on the fly in the moment and you have to adapt to it. And that's just kind of the reality of it. You can check out our, our Roadshow page if you want to see pictures of how our, our Roadshow and our interactive events look. Uh, you know, we, we, we like to pack these things up into cars and drive them all around the state and that sort of thing. I've actually packed miniature fab labs into suitcases to take them overseas.
so here's my case study picture. This is in Robinson, Illinois, this little town sort of in the, the southeast area in Illinois, just above the national parks. And, you know, they have a science safari and they invite different organizations, corporations in town and different uh, people in, invested in 4-H and learning networks to come and present on science concepts. So we brought our Fab Lab Maker equipment, but we decided to change it to be oriented a little bit more towards different scientific concepts. So at each station, you can see the kids are standing up, they're engaging with it. They're not just like sitting down and being spoken to. You know, in, in the bottom picture there, they're raising their hands. And shortly after that, they then went up and played with a bunch of stuff on the table. In, in both of these, that we're talking about scientific concepts. So the, the top one there, we talked about 3D printing, and we talked a lot about the heating and melting points of different kinds of materials, when something goes from a solid to a liquid or to a gas. And we had uh, li liquid nitrogen there to do a sort of freezing trick, and then we had some of the different kinds of plastics with the 3D printer. So we were able to talk about the science behind some of the, the manufacturing technologies like 3D printing. All right, so the next level up from that, the sort of longer engagement times, right? The you know the exhibition shows somebody might be standing at the table for like you know one to ten minutes tops, so really short periods of time. You can do workshops, and and the uh, oftentimes we develop these just by having a lot of playtime at our lab. We kind of come up with uh, little activities or projects. We might find them on the internet as well, and then we'll turn them into a workshop. And the most extreme sort of well-organized version of this I've ever seen is at the Museum of Science and Industry, where participants will walk in, they'll have 15 people, and the, in t the span of 20 minutes, they'll have them 3D design something and actually 3D print a model. And they, they do this by not letting there be any downtime and providing a lot of really good scaffolding. Uh, we like leaning towards the other end of workshops where they're longer, there's lots of playtime, and you can actually have iteration where you mess up and start over, and you can do that multiple times. And we try to have a, a larger student or a better student to teacher ratio. And, and this is because oftentimes learners learn at very different paces. You know, we have standards for reading. We have a good idea of like what your reading level should be for a given grade. But we don't oftentimes have a very good idea of like what your digital literacy level should be. You know, we're oftentimes running into kids who only have ever used to use touch screens on a cell phone and they can't actually use a mouse or they don't know how to find the desktop or save a file. You know, and so oftentimes they move at very different speeds and we have to have lots of helpers and facilitators to make these workshops go. And that's part of why the time will also be very long because you have learners moving at different paces and pursuing different directives within this, this workshop activity. We also like aiming for smaller audiences. I get really annoyed when we get large groups that are used to working with, or I should say not large groups, we get youth groups that are used to working with large groups of youth and, you know, like a park district where they use what I call the swimming pool model, where it's like 50 kids and you throw 50 kids in the swimming pool. And if you get another 10 kids, well, you know, it's no big deal. You just throw them in the swimming pool too. And that's all you needed to do. But if I have a maker workshop where every kid needs a computer and every kid needs a set of materials, adding 10 kids to that is actually a lot of work. We need more facilitators. We need more computers. You know, it doesn't scale instantly all the time. You can do teamwork and other things to try to deal with that. But really, it just it takes more planning. And, and smaller ratios and smaller classes is oftentimes where project-based learning and independent learning will work better. I also think it's very important during these workshops to summarize what you're going to do first. You know, here's the end prize. Here's what you can get to if you get through this workshop. And then having flexible documentation. You know, your workshop might occur with different numbers of kids in different settings and having that be flexible so you can match it rather than having to follow a script exactly. The script is sort of some pointers of here's some things you could do depending on your, your environment. And when you're making a workshop, you'll start out by practicing it getting feedback, and then going back and customizing it. A lot of the time you won't realize what's wrong with it or what, how well it works until you do it several times. Uh, the parts you might customize might be clarity of the ideas and instructions. Oftentimes the people that are teaching this, it's way more obvious to them you know, what things are. You know, They might use acronyms or assume knowledge the audience doesn't have, and they realize that later by paying attention to it and you know getting feedback. There's also a lot about time limits. You have to figure out how much time you should spend on something. Where are the trouble spots in all of this? And you know what equipment and materials might you need? Oftentimes you find out, oh, actually we should have brought 17 pairs of scissors because we didn't realize everybody would need to cut things in this quick amount of time or whatever it is. 
And then finally, you should really be as clear as you can on what your expected outcomes are in the workshop. You might get unexpected outcomes, and those can be great too, or really bad, depending, but you know, at least having an idea of like, here's what we want learners to get. Here's the sort of quality assurance guarantee of they're all gonna get a great 3D printed monster, or they're all gonna learn a little bit more about uh, you know, 3D design, such that we can expect them to may all be able to make their own architectural model in the future. You know, something like that. So here's our a couple of example case studies of workshops we might run. I, the top one is one that really you could run anywhere. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I don't have money for 3D printers or, you know, I don't have a big space. I don't really know how to do this. And so they think they can't do iterative design and manufacturing concepts. And one of my favorites is something that we can call storyboarding and paper prototyping. And this is done with all kinds of forms of design as you'll start out with some sort of problem prompt or some sort of idea and you have to have people take, you have people break up into groups and they develop a unique point of view that they then can express through a storyboard where they express the environment, the users, the problem or thing that's going on. And they actually just draw a little comic like you can see in the upper left picture there that communicates what's going on. And I like this oftentimes with uh, when you're coming up with an invention because then you can come up with say an interface for your invention. So if you're thinking about applications on a phone, you might draw pictures of that interface on paper and you can draw multiple pictures so that you know they tap on one button with their, their real life finger on the piece of paper and that then brings out another piece of paper that goes on top of it. And you can create these sort of fun, simple, basic versions out of paper and stickers and marker and whatever else. And they're wonderful because it allows people of all kinds of skill levels to engage. You can, this workshop will work with like real little kids that have low attention spans. It'll work with the elderly who are not very confident with computers. And if something's messed up, the cost of replacement is really low. You can just, you know, get another sheet of paper and you just, you know, getting a few Sharpies is not very expensive. So it's a workshop that works in many different areas and can lend itself really well to fabrication and design, but without being super complicated. Another example on the bottom uh, of, of how we've come up with sort of unusual perspectives and workshops and something I would encourage you to do too. We have a workshop called Plushy Robots for Girls. It's explicitly uh, limited to just women. And this is because oftentimes when you have a robot workshop or a learn, let's learn to do robots thing, it tends to be competitive and it tends to be dominated by boys. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Part of it is that because it is about being competitive and, you know, robots are oftentimes raced or they try to destroy each other as the goals. And we like things like, can you make a robot that's cute? That's actually an interesting design prompt. It's not just about, you know, the aesthetics of the thing, you know, making it sort of fluffy and, and friendly looking as part of it, but how can it move to you know, communicate an emotion of being funny or cute? Or, you know, can you get a pack of robots to dance together? You know, this is something that, that requires a lot of coordination and very delicate and intricate programming that might not really get the same sort of audience that, that you might get if you were going to do a different kind of robot prompt. So in our Plushy Robots camp, we have a lot of girls to work together to learn how to do code and teach each other and create these, these very friendly and fun little robot inventions with Arduino. And that's been something that we've, we've oh, I shouldn't say call it a camp, but it's both a camp and a workshop. So we can do the Plushy Robots example here of just, these are just pom-poms glued to little servos that are controlled by Arduinos. And you can do that activity in a, you know, anywhere from an hour to two hours, depending on how complicated you make it. Uh, and we can actually scale this into a camp where you can then make increasingly complicated robots. One of the things I do with my undergraduates at a higher level with this activity is they have to take multiple servos and get the robot to actually move across the table. You know, and then, like I said earlier, you could then try to get it to dance or do more complicated things. So these are just examples of workshops where you sort of focus on a specific area and it might be a skill like, you know, learning enough code to program an Arduino, but it also might be a, a feeling of having girls feel empowered in programming or having somebody, you know, feel like they've started to understand a, a problem and how they can solve it with paper prototyping. Uh, our next level up is we do one week long summer camps. These happen in the afternoons, typically a three hour format. And they're the same as workshops, but generally it's a series of workshops and a theme. And because you have this longer week long event, you can have participants meet each other and make connections. You can make concepts connections. So, you know, we've done this activity and this activity, and now we combine them to become this bigger activity. Uh, and it also allows you to probably work with more machines and more capacities. So you can learn several machines and then maybe later combine them to do something cooler. Uh, throughout our camps, I write support here. So, you know, you, you have to think in the longer term too. So for a workshop, you can sort of just deal with, you know, having people there for a minute and get, get, get by it. You don't need to worry about things like having recess or snacks or aftercare or dealing with emergencies. And th we work with kids a lot of the time. These are all very important things. And anybody who's done summer camps before, you know, knows about this kind of stuff. But, you know, sometimes Fab Labs are populated by or you're run by people that maybe haven't done youth programming or summer camps before. And they don't think about all of that stuff. 
And there can also be a lot of collaboration and reflection in a camp. So kids get to know each other and therefore they can work together better in teams. And you might be able to have enough time that you can reflect on what they've learned so they can better understand and internalize their own learning. Uh, and then there, the cost and funding model might be different because you're, you're accounting for all of these things. So a workshop, you can basically just sum up by like, you know, the time you have to pay staff and the cost of materials. And that might be, you know, maybe a little bit of preparation time and that's about it. Whereas camps, you might have to think about the cost of all the things I mentioned above, like registration and recess and cost of, of paying for food and so on. So just to give some examples, we have uh, 30 different summer camps we're running here in 2016. So there's far more than I'm going to talk about now. But these are all just pictures of the different kinds of camps we do. And I, I like talking through them just because people don't expect, you know, oftentimes they might think of like a camp model being like learning Arduino. And that's the summer camp. And it's like, that's not really the way we want to think about these activities. It's more about, you know, a broader objective. So the picture in the upper left is actually one of the steps in the, the design to Fab Lab camp. So after they've gone through a basic Fab Lab camp and learned lots of different kinds of tools, they're given different, different design challenges each day. And they have to build uh, increasing levels of prototypes. So they might start out with a simple prototype and then move to a more complicated one over the course of several days within a camp after they've learned all the basic machines. So, you know, that can be a more general uh, process, but it also can then involve teamwork and a sort of different level of dimension. The, the kind of funny looking guy with the eyes and the, the lights above it, his left eye, that's actually a picture, a close up picture of a backpack. So one of the camps we're running this summer is that youth will learn how to sew or if they don't, or they, I take that back, they already know how to sew. They have to learn how to sew more advanced things like backpacks. So they sew their own backpack and then they integrate electronics into the backpack. So you can see in that open zipper area that that's a our, kind of Arduino. It's called a Flora and it has these little snaps so you can attach snaps or, or conductive thread to it. It and they can route conductive thread throughout the backpack to control and do different things. So in this case, it's a turn signal backpack where they have little piezos in each backpack strap and they can tap their shoulder and it will make the light blink and as they're on their bike, they can signal if they're turning left or right. And the early version here, you know, you can see it's, it's just kind of a funky looking face. The later version has more explicit arrows, so a driver might be more aware that, you know, we're signaling to go left. And, uh, we're going to see what the kids come up with. This is a camp that we've just come up with. We've never run it before. We're going to see how far they get and how well it goes this summer. We might refine it. Another example of a camp that's fairly new is we have the Solar Powered Inventions Camp, where I gave my, my undergraduate students the prompt of, okay, you can take whatever materials you want. You have to use these uh, solar panels and this circuit, and it has to be able to charge a cell phone, make an invention, ready, go. And they came up with all kinds of things, including ridiculous stuff like sticking solar panels in hats or uh, smarter things like a curtain you could hang on a wall to block the light, but then also the, the curtain would have solar panels that then would have a charger cord hanging off of them. And, and they presented these, so they, they worked with making their ideas all week, combining a bunch of different tools, and then they had to present them at the end of the camp. And we're going to be doing this with kids this summer because we're pretty convinced they can do that too. The middle left there, you can see that's a screen printing camp. Uh, so it's a, an example of something that's not very digital. You know, you might do your initial designs on the computer, but the screen printing part can be done in the very old fashioned by hand way. And that's, that's sort of a nice example of how we, we, not everything we do is necessarily physical products, or I'm sorry, not, ever, not everything we do is necessarily uh, the use of digital tools to drive things. Uh, the middle picture there is from Paper Crafts Extraordinaire as well as our, our general camp fab labs. Uh, that's, that's a circuit card. So you know, there's copper tape running through there to light up an LED. And then there's other parts that have been cut out by an electronic controller. And, uh, you know, so I, I like this was an example because it's a camp that or an activity that can occur within a camp that doesn't really take that much in the ex most expensive materials. You know, LEDs and copper tape are quite cheap. You know, the silhouette cutter is a $120 device. It's very, very cheap and easy to use. And so you can pull together these things just using paper and basic materials that actually can communicate pretty complicated concepts. On the right there, on the flip side, if you want to do spend some money, that, that's a, a robot, a bug bot. And they, they have a variety of these different kinds of things. And we can learn from the different locomotions that insects have to modify robots to make them better able to navigate certain kinds of environments. And so in this camp, we have a biologist, an entomologist, who's going to be teaching kids about the different ways bugs get around. And then they're going to make robots to mimic those mobility patterns and see what they can learn from it. So it's programming of robots. It's also building things. And it's also learning about biology in the same camp. In the lower left there, that's a, a picture circuits piece. So students will learn about how circuits work by actually just literally drawing the circuits. And this is some, a great way to get artists into learning programming and electronics. So rather than you know sort of taking the, the standard CS approach of let's learn programming by doing a math equation, they're gonna learn programming by doing a picture. 
they draw something and then they make it interactive with lights and different connections to to make it then mobile or, or have some sort of moving component uh, so th that's going to be one of the camps that we're exploring in the middle on the bottom we have a, a, actually a costume design camp so uh, you can make the, these different you know, use different kinds of tools to fabrication cosplay costume components but then you might also use electronic controllers to animate them in some way like like you know lights that turn on on something or a shield that opens up or whatever it might be and then the lower right an example of something that's actually just a well, versions of it can be a purely digital camp. So we like using games to, as design platforms so we can have kids learn how to do, you know, real uh, actual 3D design through games. So in this case, we're using Minecraft so they can design things in a Minecraft world and then export them for 3D printing. And we can actually also do the reverse where they can take a 3D scan of a physical object and then import that into the Minecraft world. We usually do a statue of themselves. And this camp culminates in, in kids working together to actually build a city together, uh, a Minecraft city and they have to then they get to print the city at the end of it but they also have to work together to make all the connections and learn how to generate the city algorithmically so these are just a few of our summer camps there are lots of others you can go check those out with the link down there below uh, I just wanted to give a, a sort of an example of, of the breadth of how this works and talk about some of the ways that collaboration might happen within them or connections and you know throughout I guess I haven't really mentioned reflection but in many of these camps when the kids the kids fail to do something they have to reflect on it when the robot can't get over a certain terrain we ask why questions you know when they're kind of come up with a solar panel invention they have to talk to each other and present their idea and they might get feedback saying well it might not be that great of an idea or here's this thing you haven't thought of yet so the camps try to have these pieces of process that could have good pedagogy as part of them and then finally, the largest version of this is we do all the way up to university classes. So it's kids ages 8 all the way up to, I'll say, 25, because we get graduate students in there, too. Uh, and I like to connect to many kinds of disciplinary interests. So, you know, we'll have classes in, like, communications or industrial design or business or art or whatever it is. And most of these classes involve a lot of open studio time. So they learn concepts and tools, and they have a lot of time to mess around and build things on these tools. And you can use guest speakers as part of this. So, you know, you might have a class in, and you might have a guest speaker that comes from a special area, uh, like somebody that connects to the lab. Like, we have people in businesses or artists that work there, and they can become guest speakers for us. And the students that participate in these classes, it's oftentimes a chance for them to build a portfolio. So this is a big deal. When you go to employers, you know, they'll, they might care a little bit about your GPA in the sense that they might care about you haven't failed school. But, you know, the projects you've made and the things you can show them that you know how to do seem to be more important a lot of the time than, you know, the, the markings on uh, other markings maybe on a resume. And so having a portfolio of projects and, and examples is oftentimes a really powerful way to make a pitch. And so we like to teach students how to do this. Uh, and we like to connect the, the lab's mission to final projects. So in our Makerspace class, the students go through, learn lots of tool different, different tool areas. They make uh, inventions of a kind. And then as their final project, or one of their final projects, they actually have to run a workshop teaching kids in the community how to do something. They come up with their own lesson plan and actually go out there and conduct this workshop. And that we do this consistently on a semesterly basis so we can continue to provide programming for our partners. And the instructor oftentimes is an explorer and an expert in this space. So, you know, when I was doing the solar panel thing, I was learning a lot about, you know, how these electronics work, you know, what can we really get out of a cheap pan solar panel off of eBay? You know, I sort of played with them and we taught each other about as much as I taught them. And, and a lot of the students in this, the class could bring in their own expertise. And so there's less hierarchy in our university classes. And that's important. So uh, here's just some pictures. In the upper left there, it's the Makerspace class that I've taught a number of different years. Uh, this is one of the lesson plans the students came up with. And they were having the kids work in a program called Sculptress, which is kind of like where you get a digital lump of clay. They had first had to draw a concept of an environment and then and learn about watershed, so how watershed works. And then they had to create a watershed model that they could then test in science class. So they would then 3D print these models out and they could put little droplets of water to see where the water would go. And it's not a perfect simulation of the real world, obviously, but it's a good way, a good way to get the concepts across. In the upper right there, that's that's uh, making ornaments for just a, a festive holiday piece, but the kids got to design their own ornaments and cut them out, uh, combining stickers and laser cut pieces. So, you know, that was for a much younger kid audience than, than maybe the one in the upper left. Uh, and then in the lower right, you can just see how the class normally looks. This is sort of the open studio format. You've got some students presenting ideas, others working on things. Uh, in the lower right there, there we have the critique. I found that, you know, you can give students grades, but they can't care way more about it if they have to present it to their peers. Because, like, nobody knows if you get a bad grade on something necessarily. But everybody knows if you try to present and it looks like crap. So, <laughs> you know, I like that as a motivation uh, for, for students a lot better. And I, I try to keep it less about, like, 
oh, the, you know, the art for art's sake of like, you know, if you don't do art the right way, we are going to kick you out. And it's more like, no, let's present your idea and then work as a class together to talk about what's cool about it. What can we improve? How can we, you know, solve this design problem altogether? It's more collaborative oriented rather than judgment oriented. So, you know, that, that gets them motivated because they, on some level, they are scared of judgment, but on another level, it's also just very useful because you get good feedback without it being necessarily cruel. Okay, and uh, we also run open lab at our community centers. So we, we have like libraries where they, for instance, have an auditorium instead of a permanent teen space, and there's a bunch of equipment on carts, and they just kind of roll that equipment out on carts, and uh, they will run programming after school several days a week. And the really one of the one of the most important pieces about running open lab at our community partner sites is that their needs are supposed to come first. So, you know, we can have ideas for what programming we might want to do there, or what tools we should put there, but really what the library's after or what the school's after or the living assistance center's after, that should be determining it. So uh, in these environments, they're oftentimes a lot a lot less formal. It's more like just like a hangout zone. And so inquiry-based learning becomes a big thing. So you have, you know, students that will hang out in the zone or 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 you know, maybe not students, maybe other kinds of learners. And and they might have a question and they can pursue that question and people can help them answer it. Uh, but one of the things I have to deal a lot with is because we're working in libraries, we get a lot of library science students and they think it's the reference desk. They think if they sit at a table, the teens will come to them. And that's not true. <laughs> the teens oftentimes don't care. You know, they'll ignore the librarian. What works better is if the librarian goes and plays video games with the teams or tries to join the teams in doing, you know, whatever design thing they're doing, whatever they're drawing or whatever activity in the music or whatever kind of activity you have in the space, they can join them for that and, and get out there and sort of learn the teen culture and be part of their, their atmosphere. That's, that's a way to engage. And that's a way to then develop programming and really make an impact on them. So I don't really like the idea of passive librarians. I really like the idea of active and engaged librarians. Uh, these spaces can oftentimes be temporary. Like I said, you know, you might roll out carts and have a temporary piece. And uh, your equipment and talent might be pretty different. So, uh, you know, at the, at the library, we have things like, you know, video game systems right now next to silhouette cutters, right next to, you know, a 3D printer, right next to digital drawing tablets. And right next to that is the closet where we keep all the tables is the recording studio. So, you know, lots of cool different kinds of stuff. And it will match, you know, what the library wants to do. It doesn't look like a fab lab in the way that our fab lab looks like. It matches more like a fab lab in a library. Uh, and then the talent also might vary. So you might have librarians who know more about something than, than other things, and you kind of have to form your programming around that. And we, we try to partner where we bring in a staff person from our fab lab to work there, and then also work with a librarian who's got some similar skills and talent. And we spend time trying to teach the teens there to bring them in as volunteers, the next item on my list, youth teachers, but also the librarians. So, you know, oftentimes you'll get a librarian who'll say, okay, you can run the program in my space, and they sort of sit back like they're the reference desk. And we say, no, no, you get to learn with the kids, get here and sit down. And you might have to have, you know, two librarians, one who's watching, you know, make sure that the behaviors are happening or, you know, the responsible oversight person. But you can at least have some of the staff or librarians become part of that, too. Uh, we found at the Urbana Library, a lot of the, the kids, like the people that do part-time shelving or that are there sort of volunteering, they just want to get involved in it because the Teen Open Lab is fun. Is they can go learn how to do these cool manufacturing things or play games with kids or, you know, it's a way to get outside of, of maybe more boring work. Uh, so I've already talked a lot about the Urbana Free Library. Here's a picture. I know it looks funky as this sort of mosaic with blurs. We're actually not allowed to take pictures in that environment, but you can kind of make this out. There's a bunch of different tables and kids, and they're all walking around. It's a very loud space, which is why it happens in the auditorium. Uh, and, and this is actually really helpful because it gets the kids outside of other the other areas in the library. And everything there, like I said, is temporary. We just kind of you know drop down power from the ceiling. We plop a bunch of stuff out on tables, and every time it's different. And depending on what the teens are interested in at the given time, We'll, we'll modify our activities for that week or that period of time. And we try to be cognizant of how, you know, even in this space, we have to deal with male domination. So video games automatically are dominated by men, or recording might not always be something that women feel like they're welcome to go do. So we try to have a lot of female role models there. We had a female librarian who was just really incredibly good at getting all the girls to feel welcome in the space, and she did a lot with textiles and fashion design. Uh, at the Chicago Public Library, which has a similar space called New Media, for instance, uh, they have a nail painting station where you can do cool nail art. And that's something that, you know, might not be considered like the traditional computer driven maker thing but it's a place to get makers and artists into the space that that wouldn't otherwise be there and so i think including that kind of stuff should be game it's just as cool 
uh, and, and a level up from this. So on the opposite end of this, we have the very informal, you know, we have community sites where Hangout happens and digital making happens. Uh, you know, on the extreme end, you can have the Fab Academy. And this is an MIT class. You take it online. It costs $5,000 and it links you into the international community. It uh, can also be a very useful source of income for a lab where some of the income charged for the class will go to the Fab Lab that's, that's hosting the Fab Academy module or the Fab Academy chapter. Uh, and it's a really important to have local instruction. So you, you'll get this, this external uh, instructor who will help you understand general concepts and put you in touch with you know, other fab labs. That are mo about 50% of the, the course is sharing ideas, which is great. Uh, but it, it just becomes so important that you have a local instructor that knows how to teach really well and really support you because the distance learning folks or the, you know, the people giving the lecture really won't know how to teach you the, the specifics to deal with your problem or your project. So we, we've been very lucky to have somebody who's taught Fab Academy multiple times. She's really talented. She's a very good teacher. She spends a lot of time you know, paying attention to the needs of her students, both emotionally and intellectually. And that's, that's been really key to having a successful Fab Academy at our site. Uh, and very importantly, Fab Academy teaches you tools. It teaches different uh, capacities, but it doesn't teach you a lot of the stuff that I'm actually talking about now. Is If you want to learn how to run a Fab Lab or start a Fab Lab, Fab Academy will give you ideas of the kinds of stuff you can do there, but it won't teach you how to network, find funding, you know, lead people, uh, really make something that's sustainable. It won't teach you all the other mechanics that are really, really important. And in fact, if you only have Fab Academy trained people where they're basically just really you know, elite, excellent hacker engineer folks, you're gonna have a failing Fab Lab. You need other kinds of folks in your space to really make it bigger and better, to get better participation, and also just have things stay organized and connected to missions and all that sort of thing. Uh, Oh, uh, this is a part. So the participant experience header, this is when we give this talk in person, I oftentimes will have somebody with me for my staff that's done Fab Academy. Uh, and, and so Jessica here actually wrote these notes, but she had talked about how it was a demystification. It was like opening the hood of a car for her, is that Fab Academy was the first thing that sort of inspired her to really dig deep down, down into electronics and figure out how they work. Uh, she found a lot of inspiration in the ideas that were shared. Uh, she had to do a lot of reflective learning. So she would make something and it wouldn't work and she'd have to reflect on whether or not it worked. Uh, and then she would present these things. So she would present them to another community. And she she also liked that there was some teamwork, but uh, there was also this issue of completion of like, you know, you could sort of had loose deadlines of when things needed to be completed. And that was sort of a challenge for them. Okay, another piece of something you can do is there's hosted events. So we host events, uh, oftentimes makeathons or hackathons are a common way to do this, but you can also have skill shares and other similar sorts of things. Uh, but some just pointers for hosting events is you'll want to select a goal uh, right at the beginning. So rather than saying, we're going to host a makeathon, say like, we want this makeathon to help people learn these skills and bring these communities together. That kind of thing will do you a little better, probably. You also want to pick a participant base, so you know specific groups that you want there at your makeathon, because then you can help to advertise and cater it to them. Uh, you'll need obviously a planning committee to do this. Uh, networking becomes everything. When we've been hosting our makeathons, just me knowing everybody on campus has been really important to making resources happen in terms of money, getting people to come, all that kind of stuff. So having really well connected individuals on the makeathon team is really important. Uh, sponsors is a big deal, so getting corporate entities or other people to put up money for prizes will help motivate people to want to be part of your makeathon. Uh, advertising it, so not just dropping it on Facebook, but actually talking to people in person will really help with advertising your makeathon. Uh, and then volunteers, you might need people as judges or to help staff it or just help work that all out. You, you know, having a volunteer core can be really helpful with it. And uh, thinking about materials, one of the things we learned with our last makeathon is that we really should have done a miniature makeathon before we did our big makeathon, is that we should have gone through it with our own staff to do the design prompt, which is designed for the body and figure out, oh, we actually, we need all these kinds of sensors to get biometrics data and then buy those sensors as the materials. So, you know, going into it, you might not realize what participants are going to need. On some level, it is fun to have these constraints that they have to come up with something based on the materials that they've got in front of them. But on another level, you want to be able to allow them to succeed. So getting materials that really match the prompt is important. And then lastly, spaces. So, you know, having spaces that match the activities. So you might have workshops that happen during a makeathon or event. Uh, you know, having work, the space that matches that, uh, areas that can be flexible, rolling, moving tables, all that kind of thing is really helpful to makeathons. 
So here's just some pictures from the first Makeathon we did in 2015. And the concept here was it was actually accessibility design. So it was design of solutions for the elderly. And we gave them some subtracts in this. They were both beginners and advanced. And you can see in the lower left picture there, there's actually elderly from a partner institution. We worked with Clark Lindsay uh, Living Assisted, or I'm sorry, uh, the Living Assisted Home and or Retirement Village. And they had participants who came and they were they helped advise teams. Some of them participated with teams. Uh, they helped to run workshops on what it's like to be a person who's dealing with different kinds of conditions that affect the elderly. Uh, the, the elderly helped as judges, uh, and they really lent a really strong perspective to the event as they were partners at all the different stages of it, working with the youth. And that's really important because I think a lot of these makeathons is like design this solution for these people that are not part of this event. Well, that's kind of horrible is you really need that, you know, to better design the solutions and to work this out, you need those people to be part of it. So, you know, we've invited them in, even though they might not have been people we would associate with doing computer driven digital design. The elderly learned a lot and they really enjoyed it. Clark Lindsay also was a very important sponsor. They helped put up money to help make it happen. And that's that's important, too. So in the upper right, you can see what one of the teams looked like as they were inventing things. You have We had lots of kids and families. We invited, we had schools that were partnered with this that helped work out with it. Uh, and then we actually ran workshops during the event to teach them how to start with different uh, materials and concepts to, to actually make their, their devices and inventions. And over the course of about 30 hours, they had to invent something and then present it. In the lower right, you can see here, I helped to try to coach them with that paper prototyping exercise I talked about a few slides ago of you know establishing their unique point of view, presenting the idea, and then explaining what they've made as their product to help people with it. Okay, so that was a really rapid overview of many of the kinds of programming we do at the Fab Lab. I'd be happy to talk about many more examples for any one of the specific items. I really just took a category, explained some pointers on it, and then gave an example of one of the events. For almost every category, we have many, many versions of that or many instances of that. So you can go to our website and see some of the latest. Uh, there's also our Facebook page, which just has a lot of the, like, the real live chatter and events going on, pictures of life, etc. in the Fab Lab. And you can email us with additional questions and find out more, you know, to, to do go beyond this guide that we've provided here.